Genesis chapter 25, and we're at verse 24, verse 24. The Bible points out here, and when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. Remember, Rebecca is giving birth to twins. That was the promise. And we covered last Genesis study that the elder was supposed to serve the younger. That's how God elected. That's how God originally chose. He didn't say that I originally elected one to be hated and one to be loved. That is nowhere, that is nowhere found in the passage here. Right. I've already covered Romans 9 in an exegesis manner, in an expository, proper manner, expounding each and every verse and pointing out that it does not support Calvinism in any way, shape, or form. Now that I've already covered that, we'll start off with verse 24. Since I already read it, each and every word is interpreted as follows. Basically, when Rebecca fulfilled her days of her pregnancy, she finished her days where now she is about to give birth. Lo and behold, that's the idea of the word behold again. All, all of a sudden what came out were twins from her womb. Verse 25, and the first came out red all over like an hairy garment. The first one who came out of the womb was basically reddish in color, and he was hairy red all over. It's as if he was wearing a hairy garment. And they called his name Esau. That's self-explanatory. Esau is given his name because it means hairy. That's the idea. It means hairy. That's why it says like a hairy garment. The next verse reads, And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau, Esau's heel. After Esau came out, uh, Esau, his brother, was the one uh, that took hold on Esau's heel, as if there's a fight going on. Now, you might recall at verse 22, already the children were struggling in her womb. So ever since birth, Jacob and Esau, they were not getting along. That there's always this competition, one up on the other person. He wanted to come out first. However, Esau came out first. And his name was called Jacob. So the second child that came out, who tried to grab a hold of Esau, tried to have his own way of doing things was named Jacob, which properly suits him for his actions. It's supplanter, deceiver. What you're going to find out in the story of Jacob, this guy is a conniving, <laughs> conniving, wicked person. However, you're going to study later on, as I show you in this chapter, why God chose to love Esau, I mean love Jacob, and then hate Esau. And it's not because before birth. It's because of their actions. So in spite of Jacob's wicked actions, there is a key thing that he did which made God favor Jacob and pass his love upon him and why he hated Esau, which is what you want to open up your ears and listen to later on. The last part of verse 26 says, And Isaac was threescore years old when she bare them. Notice Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to the twins. If you recall, he got married at verse 20 when he was 40 years old. Like I told you before, they didn't have a child for 20 years. That's the reason why Rebekah and Isaac were praying and praying to the Lord. And the Lord took care of them. As a matter of fact, Isaac was able to live to see his grandchildren, and he actually lived longer than Rebekah. So that's why you always have to trust the Lord. You never know. Verse 27, And the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter. So that's self-explanatory. The boys grew up. Esau became a hunter. Cunning is smart, very clever. Hence, you see Esau as a picture of the 
Antichrist, because the Antichrist is a hunter. Go to Revelation chapter 6, Revelation chapter 6. Also, I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 10, Genesis chapter 10. Revelation 6 and Genesis chapter 10. The Antichrist, when he comes out in the tribulation, he comes out like a hunter. He's hunting prey. He's out conquering and to conquer. Go to Revelation chapter 6 and verse 2. And I saw and behold a white horse. That's the Antichrist on the white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given unto him and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Go to Genesis chapter 10. Genesis chapter 10. We've looked at this individual who pictured the Antichrist and I explained why. Nimrod. Nimrod. Esau matches up with the pictures of the Antichrist, the biblical characters who match the beast throughout the Bible. Genesis chapter 10 and verse 9, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Nimrod, as you might recall, he was the one who could have been the Antichrist, who could have had the first world, one world government, but God broke it apart at the Tower of Babel. The Antichrist, his occupation is a hunter, and they hunt for souls. We've seen this example with three men. One is Esau, the other is Nimrod, and then the third one is the Antichrist. Okay, we're going to look at the next verse. Jacob... The Bible points out he was a plain man. He's normal. Nothing special about him. And we see now a picture of Jesus Christ. You go back to Genesis chapter 25, the second part of verse 27. It says, And Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. Nothing special again. And he made a living. His occupation was while he was living, residing in tents. So you can basically see a mama's boy right here. He was a type that did house chores. Esau, however, in verse 27, he's a cunning, a cunning hunter, a man of the field. He's a man of outdoors. He's a man that's outdoors. Jacob was an indoor type. We see a picture of Jesus Christ Jacob, several examples can be explained why he pictures Jesus Christ. One interesting case is the word plain. And some people claim that uh, when you look up the Hebrew word for plain, it can be synonymous, actually. It can be synonymous to Jesus Christ. So I don't know how that is done, but that could be true. But we're going to look at Isaiah 53. Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53. Notice that the Lord Jesus Christ, when he was crucified, when he came down here on this earth, there is nothing special about him. The Bible says no beauty that we should desire of him. Look at Isaiah chapter 53. Notice in verse 2, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Notice a very ordinary man like Jesus Christ. Going back to Genesis. Going back to Genesis. We'll look at verse 28. Verse 28. Because Esau is a more of a manly type, we can guess that the father would favor him, and Jacob is more of the motherly type, the mother would favor him. Verse 28, and Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison. So Isaac the father loved Esau more than Jacob. And there's a reason. The carnal reason is because he ate of his venison. So deer meat. There's something wrong with Isaac's stomach. He favored Esau more based on something fleshly. 
but Rebekah loved Jacob. However, Rebekah loved Jacob more. And one of the reasons is especially given because she recall at verse 21 through 23, the Lord promised her that the younger one would be more used for the Lord, that he would be the one that would become very special. So Rebecca uh, had more favoritism toward Jacob. We're going to turn to Romans chapter 16, Romans chapter 16. In this case, Rebecca was more spiritual than Isaac. Rebecca was more spiritual than Isaac. Look at Romans chapter 16. Because Rebecca recalled what God promised to her. And because based on God's promise, she had more favoritism toward Jacob. However, Isaac, his favoritism was not based on what God promised, but rather what his flesh felt. The God is his belly. That's his God of promise. Look at Romans chapter 16. And we'll look at verse 18. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Notice they serve their own belly more. Look at Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, and verse 18. Philippians chapter 3, and we'll read verse 18. The Bible points out at verse 19, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. That was Isaac's problem. He minded earthly things. Now, as we study Isaac's life a bit more, you're going to find some key, uh, some key issues with Isaac. Uh, let's see. I'm going to put him over here. Some key issues with Isaac is he's a second generation Christian, so to speak. Now, this is a picture that I'm trying to point out here. Usually, throughout the Bible, first generation would be more sold out to the Lord. Second generation is where it gets watered down. They still love the Lord, but it gets watered down. Third generation goes total apostasy. Now, if you look at Abraham, Isaac, and Rebekah, you can clearly see that plain as day. Abraham is a man of faith. Isaac is a man of faith as well, but he watered down. There were some fleshly issues he had. Jacob had total fleshly issues, and there was a small ounce of spirituality in him that prevented him from ending up like Esau. Now, this is very important to understand. You can also see how they raised children as well. When Abraham raised his children, even though Ishmael turned out to be more of the bad apple type, we can see throughout passages that God still showed favoritism and blessing and promise toward Ishmael's seed and Hagar. They had some kind of spirituality in them. Isaac came out spiritual. Whereas Jacob and Esau, Isaac didn't raise them properly like he should have. Esau came out totally fleshly. Jacob almost came out totally fleshly. That's what we can see with the second generation with Isaac. One issue... His God was his belly. He had a fleshly issue. Now, you second-generation Christians, do you have a fleshly issue? You have something still stuck going on in you, don't you? And that's why the devil exploits that weak spot one day if you're not careful. You got to watch out for that fleshly issue. It will bite you back really hard. And we're going to see cases of Isaac, especially the next chapter. But Isaac had a fleshly issue, and it bit back on him when we look at two chapters later, when his God is his belly. He almost had one of his sons murdered, and the other one become a murderer himself. And the next chapter, we're going to see more of Isaac's issue. Let's continue reading on at verse 29. And Jacob saw pottage... And Esau came from the field, and he was faint. So, sod means to boil. So, Jacob was boiling, preparing pottage. Esau, he was coming out from hunting outdoors, and he's very weary and faint. So, he's obviously hungry. And Esau said to Jacob, 
Now notice this, this is important. Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Esau, he cries out to Jacob, his younger brother, because his younger brother is such a nice guy, so obviously he's going to give him food and feed him. Feed me, I'm begging you. That same red pottage that you're cooking, because I'm so weary, I'm hungry. Therefore was his name called Edom. That's why his name became Edom. Why? Of that red pottage. That story shows why later on his name was called Edom. The author said that his name was therefore called Edom. So it doesn't make sense that all of a sudden Esau would say, my name is Edom, or that Jacob would suddenly call him Edom, or that Isaac, Rebekah suddenly call him Edom because of what happened with the exchange. Perhaps mom and dad didn't know. But we know who actually knows what's going on behind the scenes. That's the Lord. The Lord saw all of that. And it's not Jacob and Esau writing this story. It's the Lord who's the author writing this story. And he told Moses. Yeah. So Moses is hundreds of years later. So he would obviously know this story that's been passed down from generation, 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 generation. Moses, the author, is writing the account that because of this incident, Esau's name is also known as Red. His name became known as Red. And the background story is because of that pottage. Imagine that your name is recognized by God is your belly. Who follows the second generation's fleshly issues? The third generation will follow. Third generation, don't be surprised, will follow your exact issues. And you might say, why is that? <laughs> Simple, you, uh, genetics. Even liberal psychologists blame genetics for the sin problem. That's how dreadful sin is. That it's not limited to just mere genetic factors. Sin is so awful that, yes, it will affect genetic factors. And also your next generations and your choices that you make. Yeah. We argue that choices can change the genetics. So that's where we differ from liberal psychology. However, we want to warn and point out that sin is not just limited to environmental choice factors. It's a fleshly genetic issue. It's an overall, it's an overall big cost. It's an overall big, terrible cost. That's why you have to watch yourself because when you see... I'm sure mommy and daddy can agree when they see their children growing up, they see a little bit of something that they do that the, uh, yeah. that the parents themselves have done. Yeah. Parents see, I see a little bit of me in that. Right. Don't you get sick and tired when your spouse is the one that tells you, I wonder who, when your child messes up, I wonder who he takes after, where she <laughs> takes after. I wonder who she reminds me of. I wonder what that action he did reminds me of. And then the spouse looks at you. You ever notice that? Yeah, and there's, there's an ugly fight after that. There's an ugly fight after that. But there's a lot of truth in those statements. It's an awful thing about sin. Every time we go through Esau and Jacob, we're, it's going to reflect Isaac's issues. So never forget Isaac when we go throughout these chapters. You don't want to end up what Isaac did as a second generation Christian. That's where it all begins. Where it begins is the second generation, not third. It begins with second. If we keep reading down, verse 31, and, he's, and Jacob said, sell me this day thy birthright. So like a good younger brother where Esau said, I'm going to get free food from Jacob. Jacob's going to help me out. Like a good younger brother, he says, sell me your birthright. What a great younger brother, isn't he? Really loves his older brother. Notice what a messed up family. It shows what kind of father or, you know, what kind of upbringing the father was doing. What was he doing? I'll tell you what he was doing. He was enjoying his first generation's blessing. And getting so busy, caught up with enjoying the first generation's blessings, he lacked discipline of himself. He was too relaxed. And because he was too relaxed, 
He, wasn't, he didn't raise his children strictly according to the admonition of the Lord. He, his parenting became relaxed as well. Now, is anyone getting under conviction here? That's the generation we live in. You don't want to become that relaxed generation. You never want to become that. But the more and more that uh, I do the pastoring as a church and the more and more that I live throughout the years, I can see with people how responsibilities become more lax and lax and relaxed and relaxed. And then the whining and the complaint and the sensitivity is 10 times higher. That's good. This is, we live in an age of unaccountability now. And then we depend on someone to take care of the whole job for us because it makes it easier for us. Why do you think socialism is so popular now? That's good. You don't want to become that person. You don't want to dump everything on the leader. You want to be the leader yourself. You're in charge of your own life. That's important to understand. Okay, let's look at Genesis chapter 25, and then we'll look at verse 31. Uh, again, Jacob told his older brother, I want you to sell me, sell me uh, today your birthright. Birthright, as some of you can already know, it's a right that's given to the eldest child. And Jacob, he has this mindset of selling. He has this mindset of selling. He's saying, if I'm going to give it to you, it's being sold to you. Jacob's a type of character that you're going to find out later on. If he's a supplanter and a deceiver, he wants to basically make money off of you. So this guy, he's always going to be the type that will try to grab your money. Whenever you're around Jacob, it's like, well, it's not a free lunch. What's the catch? Yeah. Imagine being his friend. <laughs> Imagine being Jacob's friend. <laughs> Can't live in peace. You're always holding on to your wallet. Yeah. <laughs> if we keep reading down, Verse 32, and Esau said, behold, I am the, at the point to die. Uh, look at that statement carefully. Esau, he cries out, hey, look at me right here. Remember, behold is a word that's commonly used throughout the book of Genesis. And that phrase is, to point, is supposed to point out, pay attention to this part. That's the idea. Pay attention to this part. That's what behold is referring to. Pay attention to this part. I'm... I'm, going, I'm at the point of dying. No, he's not going to die. He's very fleshly. Esau's issue is he's a very fleshly man. Harry, right? It points out how fleshly he is. Pottage, that's food, points out how fleshly he is. You know what the flesh is? Oh, I'm about to die if I don't do what? This sinful thing? This fleshly thing? When you do a spiritual deed for the Lord, isn't it amazing how many Christians just uh, come to the point of, oh, I'm about to die. No, you're not going to die at visitation. Yeah. It's just hot, that's all. Yeah. You're not going to die. It's a fleshly issue right here. Right, right, right. Oh, I... I'm about to die. I'm going to lose my job because what? You're afraid your boss is going to see you hold your street preaching sign. Your neighbors are going to see you or what is it? See, that's a fleshly issue. It's a fleshly issue. Let's go to verse 32. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? Oh, that's so fleshly. He said, what good is this birthright to me? Wow. What are you talking about, Esau? The birthright has a lot of benefits. Right. It has a lot of benefits, but he's rejecting the benefits. Let's look at Esau's birthright benefits. And basically, we can see what it is. One is that he's the eldest. Because he's the eldest, the eldest is going to have more of the rights, the legitimate rights. Legitimate heir. 
Another thing is because this is so important, believe it or not, he can prophesy. He can prophesy. Because remember, Abraham... He was a prophet himself, and then Isaac was also a prophet. You recall he was interceding Rebekah's prayer when she wanted a child? So Isaac inherited that. Jacob, he actually prophesied, when you look at Genesis 49, he prophesied about the coming Messiah. So there's the power of prophecy that's given but Esau lost that. Dr. Upman gives several cases of what would have happened with Esau if he uh, kept the birthright. What he would have had was also the line of Christ, the line of Christ. We're going to look at several passages here that will demonstrate this. Um, let's see. Well, uh, we won't turn to this passage, sorry. I take that back. I'll just write the benefits here. Another one is the Abrahamic blessing. The Abrahamic blessing. So let me review again. The line of Christ. Imagine the Messiah coming out of your lineage. You reject that? What good is this birthright to me? He didn't care about that. Lastly, the Abrahamic blessing. The Abrahamic blessing is not just inheriting being the legitimate heir, but it is God's promise that everybody wants to inherit and try to be a Jew. I'm a Jew, I'm a Jew. You hear that nowadays. Everybody wants the Abrahamic blessing. But God gave it specifically to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Esau would have been that one, but he rejected it, and that's why Jacob inherited the Abrahamic blessing. Let me move over here. Let me know if I'm cut off. Okay. All right, that's fine. So the Abrahamic blessing, the line of Christ, the ability to prophesy, and becoming the legitimate heir. That's really sad. That's really sad. Dr. Ruckman also claims, if you go to Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 17, Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 17, that there's a double portion, that there's a double portion. Deuteronomy chapter 21 and verse 17. The firstborn can inherit a double portion it points out right here, but he shall acknowledge the son of the hated for the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he hath, for he is the beginning of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. You'll notice right here that the firstborn child, he has the rights to get double portion as well. We're going to look back, go back to Genesis. Let's look back to Genesis. Chapter 26. Genesis chapter 25, excuse me, and then uh, we left off at verse 33. And Jacob said, swear to me this day. And he swear unto him. That's self-explanatory. Jacob told Esau, I want you to swear to me today that you're going to give me your birthright. Esau swore to him. And he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Hence, he sold the birthright to Jacob. Jacob bought it. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils. So Esau got what he wanted from Jacob. Jacob handed him over bread and also the red pottage of lentils. And he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Esau, having no care in the world, it didn't convict him, it didn't bother him, he didn't have a guilty conscience. As soon as he ate up his fleshly desire, he ate and he drank, then he got up, went on his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. 
Hence, we see all from this case, Esau hated, he rejected his birthright. Go to the book of Hebrews. We're going to look at the book of Hebrews. Esau rejected it. Esau rejected the birthright that could have been his. There are two issues we're going to look at. We're going to look at Esau's issue, and we're also going to look at uh, Jacob's issue. We're going to look at Esau's issue, and we'll also look at Jacob's issue. The Bible points out that Esau's issue, and it's very sorrowful to think about. It's very sobering to think about. A lot of people think that repentance is when you're crying, but actually that is not real repentance. Just because you cry, it doesn't mean that you're genuinely repentant. The Bible points out that Esau, even though he was very careful, he was very careful with his tears, that repentance was not considered genuine to God. You ever seen uh, people in the courtroom when they get caught that they start crying? And then they go, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. And no, that don't mean that they're genuinely sorry. It doesn't show right there. It's more of, which is really sad to think about, but it is very true. It's actually selfishness. It's actually selfishness on their part. And that is the reason why they cry. Okay, we're going to look at the book of Hebrews chapter 12, chapter 12 and verse 16. Chapter 12, verse 16. And then I'm going to cover pretty much every line for Hebrews 12, 16 and Genesis 25 because we have got a lot of good stuff here. We've got a lot of good stuff. We're going to look at uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and Genesis chapter 25. The Bible points out in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 16, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Notice right here that Esau is known to be as a profane person. That's pretty bad. That means considered outside of God. So he was cut off from the Lord. Why? He was cut off from the Lord, not at the beginning of creation before birth. That's the problem with people. When they say, uh, when the verse says, Jacob, have I loved Esau, have I hated? As I point out to you before, that was over a thousand years later, and that was referring to Esau's people. That was referring to his nation. His free choice is what caused the Lord to cut him off, not before birth, because notice that verse 16, profane person. He's cut off based on what? Who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Not before birth. It's that action that because of just one, come on, man, chili? For one bowl of chili? You give up your birthright? That's pretty serious issues right here with Esau. Yep. The Bible words it one morsel. Esau's sin, let's compare it with uh, a fleshly Christian. Come on. Let's compare it with a fleshly Christian. His sin are as follows. We can see that he didn't care. He didn't care. It was demonstrated when after he finished the meal... He didn't have a guilty conscience. Wow. He didn't care. He didn't have a guilty conscience. Uh, he didn't have guilt. He didn't have guilt. He said, what profit is this birthright to me? Wow. Notice he didn't see the value. Now, Christian, I want you to look at yourself. Do you value your birthright? Okay. Do you value your salvation and the blessings that accompanied it? You don't value it, do you? You don't care about it. For basically one, so it shows limited. It shows how limited your desire is. For a limited fleshly desire, 
you give up the permanent. Wow. So this is prioritized for the permanent spiritual and the long, uh, the long blessing, the overall blessing. That's a serious issue right there. That's a serious issue. Well, Esau did have guilt, you might argue, but verse 17, for ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Now, that's a very serious issue. The reason why he didn't have guilt was already demonstrated at verse 16. Verse 16, he didn't care about it. But then, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. That was when Jacob uh, took, the, took the blessing from Esau. At two chapters later, we're going to find out. So when Esau was at that point of losing everything, see, that's the thing. When he gets caught, when he loses everything, that's when he starts to find place of repentance and cry over it. But still, there's selfishness in there. So what's very important to understand is you better beware of selfish repentance. Okay. There's a thing point. called selfish repentance. Yeah, selfish good. repentance is basically you're crying over yourself. You feel sorry over yourself. That's good. You feel bad for poor, or you, poor old you right. suffering. So then I'm sorry yeah. and I didn't mean to. And no, that's not what it is. There's something there that you don't care about the hurt and damage you've done for the other person. Right. And that is clearly demonstrated with Esau's case that he didn't have any sorrow or empathy over the other person. He was just sorry over himself. Wow. And because, I mean, he wanted to murder Jacob. Right. That shows right. there's that lack of empathy in there. When there's a repentance, you better watch out for selfish repentance. Always crying and saying, I'm sorry and stuff like that. No, watch out. You got to look at your heart and say, are you really sorry? Is it just selfishness that you're saying that? Because you look bad. Because you're suffering the consequence. Because you want to get out of there. Is it a sudden emotion that just came over you? You got to watch out for that. Beware of selfish repentance. That's a sign of a fleshly person. Remember that. Your repentance is fleshly and it's not spiritual. Now we're going to look at Jacob's sin. Now, Jacob became beloved in spite of his issue. Jacob was used by the Lord in spite of his issue. Now, shouldn't he suffer as much? Sometimes we might wonder... Maybe uh, Jacob could get his fair share of the consequence, or maybe Esau got the brunt end of it, so it doesn't seem as fair. But there's a clear difference here why God is more merciful to Jacob than Esau. Jacob, he is no doubt a deceptive trickster, but there is one thing that you want to mark down and remember, that way God can still give you favor. He still had a desire for that blessing. Yeah. He had a desire for God's blessing still. That's important to realize. Jacob had a desire for God's permanent spiritual blessing. He didn't think about the temporary like many of us are living out today. Jacob's sin is a desire for God's permanent blessing. Why would that be his sin? Okay, so first of all, that's the reason why God is still merciful. But the reason why that's his sin is he used wrong means. Now, Christian, look at yourself before we get hard on Jacob. When we want God's blessing on our life, I wonder how many of us use deceptive means, okay. use our own intellect to get what we want, and it's not the right way. Here's a great example. 
You say, uh, God, I want to marry the right person. And then when you pray about that, instead of waiting on the Lord, you do it your own way. And then you have spiritual reasons to justify. You have spiritual reasons that I prayed for it and God provided me this wonderful person and we're together forever. Oh, is that really God's will? What does, uh, one, what does the family think about it? Two, is God's will on it in spite of family differences or approval? Three, is it a good testimony for, are you thinking about all this kind of stuff? Are you thinking about all that kind of stuff? So people don't care, and then they rush the gun. They do whatever they want to to get married, and then they marry the wrong person, and then what happens is divorce happens later on. And then people use spiritual excuses. Well, I had a spiritual reason to divorce. Okay. And they'll use the three grounds of divorce, you know, fornication, desertion, you know, death. So then they'll try to use one of those means. Right, right. You know, that's what a spiritual Christian does for something that pleases his flesh. Are you a Jacob? Are you a Jacob? How many pastors have I seen do something spiritual for the Lord, but they do it through wrong means? Okay. Well, I have to get these souls saved, so that's why I have to compromise right. and teach wrong doctrine so that I can get those lost people into my church and keep them here. Right. See, that's Jacob. That's Jacob. God don't approve of that. You got to watch out for that. Let's look at Proverbs 28. Proverbs 28. What is the problem with Jacob that you can see yourself here? In Genesis, we see one, he used his own way. And no, I'm not talking about your own way of living out in sin or in the flesh. I'm talking about your own way of trying to fulfill God's spiritual uh, blessing, doing a spiritual thing for the Lord. Are you doing it your own way? That's dangerous. That's a dangerous way to live. You never live out your life that way. Second, so you do it your own way. Secondly, you do it dishonestly dishonestly how many pastors have done something sneaky and they always keep claiming but it's for your glory lord it's for your glory yeah, lord cool. dr Elton mentioned in his ad lib commentary about the judgment seat of christ the number one excuse jesus hears at the judgment seat of christ from people who get nothing and no rewards is but i've done that for your glory lord it was for your glory. It was for your glory. That's it. There is, how dare you use something dishonest in the name of Jesus Christ? Right. How different are you from those Catholic inquisitors okay. who tortured people, put them in iron coffin maidens, burned them at the stake for the glory, for your glory, Lord. That they baby sprinkled, whole, that they did holy water over it to give it God the glory, to give God the glory. That's, that's wicked. You never use dishonest means for that one. Your own way, you're dishonest. Here's the number one reason. You're impatient. Okay. You want it immediately. You are very impatient. Look at the book of Proverbs, chapter 28, in verse 22. He that hasteth to be rich, that was Jacob's issue. He wanted to be rich with the Abrahamic blessing. But he hasted. He should have waited. God promised that he would inherit it, but he was hasty. He couldn't wait. Hath an evil eye, and considereth not that poverty shall come upon him. Notice that he's going to pay the consequence after that. People always rush the gun, and it costs them something. Go to the book of Exodus. Go to the book of Exodus. Chapter 3. Exodus chapter 2. Excuse me, Exodus 2. Now, you know how long it, it took for Jacob to finally settle down and get things reconciled with Esau? 20 years. So what happened? Because of his sin, he had to wait 20 years to finally get back, 
to the promised land to fully inherit the blessing more. It took him 20 years. When you rush to do something spiritual for the Lord, you can do something costly that will cost you 10, 20, 30, and yes, even 40 years. Moses had to wait till he was 80 to be finally called by God. Moses is a great guy. The Lord mightily used him. Don't get me wrong. But for crying out loud, I, I don't want to I don't want to lose 40 years of my life for that. He lost 40 years. Look at Exodus chapter 2. He murdered an Egyptian because he wanted to deliver his people Israel. He didn't wait on the Lord like he was supposed to. And God didn't call him until he was 80. Exodus chapter 2. The Bible points out in verse 11, And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens. And he spied an Egyptian smiting an Hebrew, one of his brethren. There's always a good intention that's dangerous. There's a, there are some good preachers that talked about don't confuse your burden with your calling. That is very dangerous. A lot of times we have a burden for lost souls, but then because we have a burden for the lost soul, we rush God's timing, and then in the end, it wasn't what God called us to do. The Bible points out at Exodus chapter 2, verse 11, Moses saw their burdens, verse 12, and he looked this way and that way, and, we, and when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. He murdered. And notice that at the end, verse 15, Now when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian. He ran away and he sat down by a well. So he was gone. He was gone. He lost 40 years. He lost 40 years because of what he did with his sin. All right, returning to our main text. Returning to our main text. Now, are you a Esau? You have these fleshly issues. You got to look at this, these cases here. Or are you a Jacob? Are you a Jacob that, you know, you're doing something spiritual, but you're doing it in the wrong means, the wrong means. Now, notice these boys were born because of a second generation. Now, notice how small this thing is, how big this thing is. Yeah. Do you realize that's how sin goes with every generation? Right. So, if you got your weaknesses and don't think it's a big issue, remember this, the next generation could carry it three times more. And that's why parents are reaping the consequences of what they've sown. Because they couldn't control themselves, the children could definitely not control themselves after that. And you're reaping that. That's a horrible thing to go through. It's a horrible thing to go through. Let's look at uh, Genesis chapter 25 and then verse 26. But the last part of verse 34 shows the main difference that I want to point out again. Esau despised it. Jacob desired. That's why... The, this was the main difference here. That's a huge difference. If you want to stay in God's favor, and I don't care how messed up you are, if you want to stay in God's favor, there's got to be a desire there. If there is no desire in there, you're really lost. You're really lost. You need to remember that. That will be extremely helpful for you in the future. Because look at how wicked, we're going to, we're going to see how wicked Jacob lived his life. He is definitely a fleshly person. He is not considered, in my knowledge, a hero of the faith. But God still put him that way. God still put him that way. And the reason why is there was, he had a desire. If you don't have that, then you're shot. Remember that. That's the reason why it seems like Esau had the brunt end. He had the unfair part of the treatment compared to Jacob. Even though you would think that Jacob should get it more. Let's... Uh, Keep reading off right here. Okay, am I totally standing off the camera? I'm okay? Okay, then. Uh, let's look at verse uh, 1. Verse 1. 
And there was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. Now there's a famine in the land and it's, uh, it's besides, so it's next to the first famine that Abraham went through during his days. Remember that Abraham went through a famine. You might recall that. So here's the next famine that comes out for Isaac. And Isaac went, to, went unto Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. So Isaac, he went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. And he was located in Gerar. Now Abimelech, if you might recall, he lived during the time of Abraham. However, uh, it's going to be hard to pretty much believe that Abimelech is still alive when Isaac went down there. So the explanation is given as follows. It's the same thing as we will look at, I think a great example is the book of Genesis. Let's go to Abraham again, okay? Let's go to Abraham again. Genesis 12. Genesis 12. There are several cases why this can still be okay. The several cases are as follows. I will put a box right here. One is Herod. Herod. If you might recall, the Bible talks about Herod, but there's so many times it mentions Herod. So, Herod is a title or the next offspring just took that name for himself. So we can see that it's possible that the next generations, when they take over their father's lineage as king, they would take their title or even their name for themselves. That's important to understand. Take the title or their names for themselves. Herod's one. Another one is Candace. And actually, if you look at Acts chapter 8, it mentions Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, but it points out, if you uh, look up the history behind that uh, word, it's not a name. It's actually a title. It's a title given to the Ethiopian queens. And the third one, which we're going to look at, which should definitely prove it, is Pharaoh. Yeah. So Pharaoh is obviously not a name. It's a title. Let's, but you will notice that the Pharaoh mentioned in Genesis chapter 12 is repeated with Exodus chapter 1, Pharaoh. So a lot of centuries passed on between them. That cannot be the same guy. Look at Genesis chapter 12. Notice in verse... 15, verse 15, the princess also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. Now look at Exodus chapter 1, Exodus 1. Now this is Pharaoh alive during the time of Abraham, but then we see Pharaoh alive during the time of Moses, which is centuries later. Well, obviously this Pharaoh was not immortal. We'll look at Exodus chapter 1. And notice that the Bible uh, reads out at, uh, let's see, verse 22. And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. Well, obviously, that is not the same Pharaoh. That explains Abimelech. Go back to Genesis 26 again. That will explain Abimelech. So it's either a son that took the name or a title that the son took for himself. Now, it could be possible, it is possible, it could be the same Abimelech from Abraham's day. But it's very, very unlikely. Verse 2, And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt, dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. So, remember Isaac, he goes to Abimelech, king of Gerar. He's king of the Philistines. God appeared to Isaac. And then he tells him this, don't go to Egypt. Now, isn't that interesting? It shows that Abraham, when he went down to Egypt during the famine, was not right with the Lord. God does not approve of Egypt. He told Isaac, don't go to Egypt. He told Isaac to dwell in the land. His actual residency is going to be in the land that God tells him is going to be his land. Remember, God made a promise to Abraham 
that this is the land that you're going to live. It's going to be yours. That's the land of Canaan. Verse 3, sojourn in this land and I will be with thee. So notice that God tells Isaac that the land he's going to dwell in is obviously, we know, Canaan. But when he went to Gerar, it's sojourning. Sojourning, not living, not dwelling, it's sojourning. That means temporarily residing. And I will be with thee and will bless thee, for unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries. And I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. Again, that's self-explanatory. God's saying if you sojourn, reside here, I'm going to be with you. Uh, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to bless you. Because for you and your offspring, I'm going to give you all these countries. And I'm going to make sure that I perform, that I complete, that I fulfill the oath, the promise that I swore to your father Abraham. Did you catch verse 3? Give all these countries. Did you see that? Yeah. Notice, then, what are countries? Not just, uh, uh, not just certain cities, countries. So God gave a promise to one is verse 3, Gerar, okay? Land of the Philistines. So Isaac's promised land is not limited. The promised land is not limited to the land of Canaan. It includes as follows. The promised land will include Gerar, land of the Philistines, to Egypt. That's a huge chunk of land. God promised that not just Canaan, but Gerar and Egypt will be given to the Jews because he made an oath and a promise to Abraham. That's a huge chunk of land that God promised to them. Verse 4, And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and will give unto thy seed all these countries. So that's self-explanatory. God says, I'm going to make, make uh, your seed to increase. They're going to multiply. They're going to be big as the stars of heaven. So that's a huge size. I'm gonna, that's why they need a huge chunk of land. You can see that. That's why Satan always tries to shrink the Jews. The Jews, they don't make that much of a population. Why? It shows that there, is a, there are spiritual hands behind the scenes. Jew is the greatest evidence that the Bible is real. The Jew is the greatest evidence. There's no doubt about it. God gave a promise. Don't you think Satan wants to wipe them out? He tried to wipe them out so many times throughout history. Scatter them. He says right here, uh, the next part of verse 4, he's going to give to Isaac's seed, so his offspring, all these countries. That's a huge chunk of land because they're going to be as, num uh, as numerous as the stars. And thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. God says, through your offspring, your seed, all the nations around the world, they're going to receive that blessing because of your seed. That's why we're not seeing it right now. It's not until God comes down here on earth, sets up as king of kings, lords of lords on the earth, that his capital city is going to be Jerusalem. And the city of Jerusalem, he's going to rule the world. And all those nations are going to come and uh, be blessed because of the Jews. We're going to finish it off at the book of Isaiah 2. It's a promise that God gave. Go to Isaiah 2. Because they're going to keep increasing during God's kingdom on the earth, that's the reason why they need a huge chunk of territory. But think about it. Gerar, Egypt, and all the other pagan nations, what happens when God comes down? Isn't he going to wipe out a huge number of them? That's why they don't need that much territory. Look at Isaiah chapter 2. We'll look at verse 3. Uh, verse 2, and it shall come to pass in the last day, see it's the last days, not now, that the mountains of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. And notice, all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us, teach us of his ways 
and we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from where? Jerusalem. See, Jerusalem is where uh, the promised land is given. So the Jews are the ones that God's going to set up his kingdom, and all the nations are getting blessed because of the Jews. That's going to happen in the last days. All right, we'll stop it right here. Uh, next, the next Genesis study, we're going to cover a lot of interesting things in this chapter. There's a lot of interesting things that I want to cover with Isaac's fleshly issues. There's a lot we can learn from that, and it explains why Jacob and Esau ended up the way that they lived. Uh, Father, thank you so much for salvation through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the truth of your word. I pray that you'll bless the next service and the Lord's Supper will be honoring and pleasing to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.